Google, I think, are trying to do it themselves. They're trying to make you browse less because they're putting everything on the front page. So that if you're searching flights, first thing that comes up is Google Flights to one-click book. Shopping is there to one-click buy something. Like, yeah. they know that this pattern is something. And I think slap AI, AI on it and it's a different group. Welcome to another episode of Creator Lab. We've got a special guest here today, Ben Tosser. Welcome to the show, mate. Welcome again. Yeah, I know. Man. Part two. There aren't many people that make it to part two, uh-huh. so this is a special okay. occasion. Because yeah, okay, but- so for people who didn't watch the first episode, we had you on. I think probably two plus years ago, from my memory. Um, and you're, you're also the founder of Makerpad, which was you know the leading no code platform. Got sold to Zapier rhymes with happier i learned that just before the call so i gotta mention that um obviously zapier a lot of people use that for a lot of the no code stuff and linking different platforms to each other um so perfect acquisition for makerpad i'm sure like zapier was one of the top three tools you would probably be recommending in a lot of your work um and now in the last i, I guess has it been a few months it's been pretty quick you've started ben's bites yeah, October 10th is when it started. Damn, all book. right. Yeah. All right. So obviously, you know, this is the third episode or fourth episode I've done in a row on AI. So it is the hot stuff in the tech world right now with OpenAI getting a $20 billion valuation, chat GPT dropping. You know, there's been some really, really cool stuff in that space. And Ben's Bytes has been my kind of go-to source for the daily roundup you do is great. And you're, you're just a really good curator. Like I know you did that with MakerPad and the no-code world in a different way because you're also doing tutorials and stuff and maybe that's coming down the line but um ben's bite so far i mean i knew you were hitting big time when i was getting it sent in whatsapp groups from people who yeah. don't know you and they're like hey you guys should subscribe to ben's bites and i was like oh okay this is that's how we know it's hitting the it's hitting that velocity you know um yeah. so yeah everyone first straight up should go and subscribe to that if you want to know what's going on in the space you're doing the best job of it um and yeah. so we're, we're not going to do a whole hour discussion on building a newsletter like we, we've talked about a little of that stuff in the past on the pod uh maybe we'll get to like your idea for it and why you why you've chosen this uh, a little bit but really we want to go into and pick your brain around the latest in ai all the crazy stuff you're seeing a bit of a existential discussion around you know the big players where it's going in the next year um and yeah so we'll, we'll just see how it goes but i think there's plenty for us to talk about um but before we do that I, i'm curious what is going on with your situation now at zapier because you've been there since you've sold it um and you yeah. you were saying you've been doing some ai stuff there yeah, so I sold it in March 2021. We are January 23 right now. Um, so coming up to my two-year anniversary, and yeah, I'm, I'm focusing a bit on AI. So like the AI team at Zapier, there's a few of us who are looking at AI and like the open AI integration launched on Zapier recently. It was actually a community-built integration from Yohei. So shout out to Yohei who built that and then the Zapier team sort of adapted it and then like put it through officially. Um, but yeah, trying to basically see sort of an extension of the no code stuff is what else we can do with also not having to code, but introducing AI into, into our apps and our ideas and workflows, which I think lots of people want to do now, especially these days. Um, so yeah, just figuring out like use cases, what we can do, how we can integrate and like do a bunch of stuff there. So I've, just been tinkering about a bunch of that, but it's essentially like, yeah, evangelizing people, building cool shit with AI and Zapier. Amazing. Just trying to do loads of that, really. Love it, man. And I think from my side, I can see the parallels from what you did before with MakerPad. And I've also had Tom Osmond on the show. He was, I think, one of your first employees, if not the first. Yeah, the first, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, friend of the show, both you guys and the NI pod that I do as well. Um, and we did an AI episode like a month ago with him, which I think you, you saw that as well. Um, and I think what you two did, I, when I first came across MakerPad, what you did really well was just being the face of this new emerging thing, right? Like there's no code. People used the phrase, you know, a few years ago, that was really like, up and coming and everyone's trying to get their head around it to understand this big trend and you positioned yourself perfectly to say all right we're not experts in it yet but we're gonna 
become experts by learning on the job and sharing what we're learning. And then you got really, really good at it and you made all these tutorials and you made this membership site where people paid. Um, so that's for people who haven't heard the previous episode or heard of MakerPad. Um, so what I like what you're doing now though is, you know, you've had a, a big win there, right? Like you've, you're sitting in this nice, beautiful house that you just bought, I'm sure with some of the proceeds from the sale. We talked about last time you had this dream of getting the this cool car that you got to get as well, which was kind of cool to hear. Um, but you're back at it, which is what I love. Like you're, you're like, okay, that was a nice win, but now it's time to get on with building stuff again. So even though you're you're still working at Zapier, you've got this thing going on the side, and I think you're following the playbook perfectly, right? Like starting off with an email newsletter for this makes the most sense, just given everyone's. It's a really fast-paced, uh, you know, fast-moving area, and a newsletter, a daily newsletter, five minutes is like perfect for this. And no one really, I, I'm not really seeing anyone doing a great job of it apart from you so um great to see so yeah. um let, let's move on to kind of the ai part so we we talked i mentioned earlier about you know open ai just got a 29 billion dollar valuation i think that puts them um, is it 29 or did it's i pending pending, pending. okay all right 29 billion. 29 all right. Billion. Yeah. all right so and for people who don't know it started by you know well the head of it is sam altman he used to be the head of uh y combinator you know kind of silicon valley OG um, and I think Elon Musk was originally involved with it but no longer and uh, yeah they, they've been really releasing all the cool stuff that has been coming out in this space uh, a lot of it was built off the Google kind of open you know stuff they open source from my understanding in like 2015 or 16 um, so we're, we're going to get on to kind of those players in a minute but like just from your point of view you're seeing a hundred times more stuff than I am like how would you describe this this growing space and the different categories and why you're so excited about it? Um, yeah, well, I guess it kind of follows on from the no-code stuff. Like the, the, re the in reason I was interested in no-code was I can't code, I'm not technical, and I have no desire to be. I don't want to be. Like, it's just, I, I tried code, it just doesn't work for me. So I just didn't believe that that was going to be the future. And I think now seeing all this AI stuff, like there's a, a software, there's stuff, there's like what what my mum was sort of described, like there's something in the computer that's doing something. But I, don't really <laughs> know what it is. I mean, that could be software to be fair. But that's brilliant. It's like, yeah. There's something that is like it's designed and it's trained and it's built for specific use cases. And a lot of those use cases actually convert to like, that's where the business value is made for a lot of people, whether that's, in their own software that they've built or automations, or it's actually like a service that I'm a copywriter, I will write an article for you, then I will deliver it to you via email, Google Docs, whatever. So seeing this like just chat interface where you can put something in and then you get a blog post come out of it, or you put a prompt in and then you get an image come out of it, like that is just a different level of what we've really seen in the future, like in the past, I think we, you could have had services that were like that, that felt like it felt a bit like that, but nothing felt as magic as these versions of that, which is because of where AI is. Um, and I just, I don't know this. It's some, there's something in it where you feel like nothing can go back from this moment. You can't go and unsee or unexperience any of these situations. And there's plenty of use cases that are like, stupid or like just a bit for fun and plenty that are the exact same copy of as everyone else can build but i think there's still like some fundamental pieces that ai will change a lot just a lot like it'll change so yeah. much stuff. i think like, i'm usually just always thinking what's the positive side of that like and also like great i don't want to do boring stuff how do I do less stuff? I'm lazy. I am lazy, even though I've created MakerPad, which felt like lots of like content. And now this Ben's Bytes email, which is a daily email. I never thought I'd do an email. I never thought it'd be a daily email, but here I am. And it's just because there's so much happening and so many new things. There's like, I think there's like 150 to 200 research papers released every Monday to Friday. Which is just what? that is wild. And yeah, I didn't realize it's that much. Yeah, and OpenAI, like a lot of this, like Chat GBT and all of that, is basically based off of one research paper that came out whenever it did, 
Um, so you think, okay, well, if, if OpenAI is hiding in one of these research papers, some of this research, you've really got to try and look at and understand it for one and read through all of those things or like try and see some patterns. And I think that's where that's where it's most interesting is where there's like, oh, there's a new language model, large language model that's come out around proteins or it's around like there's a specific one for science in a specific way that's built differently. It's not just everything built on top of open AI, which currently is mostly the landscape now. It's like most of the tools you use are using open AI still. It's just like they've created a different form on the front. Um, yeah. yeah. So much so, like the possibility of things to be created with software now is exceptionally higher than it was before. Yeah. And so I think um, for people who've never used any of the no code tools, like what stood out to me when that first, you know, I was watching a lot of your tutorials. That's how I kind of got in touch with you originally. And you would say, well, previously you were, and I might just butcher this completely, but you're using, let's say, an SQL database on a server somewhere, but now you're using Airtable, and it, this is an easy way you can drag and drop this thing and format in this way. Um, that might be completely inaccurate, by the way, so correct me if I'm, I'm wrong <laughs> in that. But you, you're using like Airtable as a backend versus like this more complicated um, stuff that you had to do like 20 years ago. Um, and and so what I'm now seeing, let's actually start talking about real use cases and examples. So I tried opening chat GPT just now, but unfortunately the server is down because yeah. uh, people, too many people are using it. But uh, one of my really good friends, Kieran Doyle, who might be listening to this right now, he, he told me he saved eight hours of work with a simple command saying, can you make this Google app script for me that does X, Y, Z? Um, and because he'd been trying to like fix this problem for a long time, he told me, and he, he was able to basically fix it with this one command. And other technical people, like you know, real coders, people that I speak to, a lot of them are saying to me they're already using is it Copilot from yeah. um, what's that part yeah. of yeah. GitHub exactly? So they're already you know a lot of the code they're writing is, is already using this kind of AI assistant, and it's just the way I. Th visually think of it is you're typing and it's just a little boost it's just like oh, i'm already starting to type something and it just fills out the next part basically for you like, yeah you sort of need it you need to think of the ai stuff because like, there's lots to talk about and i'm sure we'll get into it of like ai is going to take care of our jobs but it's more that you'll then become the it's like a, you work in a sandwich it's like you started off with the bread you've got yeah. the idea of i'm trying to build this thing ai helps you build that thing whatever that thing is blog post some code and then you've got to like sort of just steer it oh not no no not too far over there and come back over this way actually it should be this instead of that can you rechange look can you change that thing or rewrite that sentence i think we just sort of become more like conductors we don't need to know how to play every instrument but we know what that one sounds like and that one sounds like and when they come together they sound like this and you're like operating that thing yeah um, that's how i see it and that's where a lot of the parallels come back to that the makeup pad stuff you did right because it was giving people like me and you who aren't super technical the ability to create stuff at a scale that we didn't have before um so like moving on to some of those actual use cases i know chat gpt is a an assistant um or like a chat bot essentially you can uh, how would you describe chat gpt for someone who's not used it before yeah i guess it's like a a chat bot that actually works <laughs> that actually works uh, as opposed to siri or something like that no, which... I, mean, I mean more like the sort of bots you get on a website you're trying to complain about something and then you're like oh i'm gonna to speak to someone like oh, those sort of interfaces it's just a yeah. like, like the customer a... service ones yeah yeah, yeah exactly but i mean it sounds like a phone jacker um you, did you ever watch phone jacker yeah. in the uk there yeah. was this show and it would be like a prank call and you'd be pretending to be the customer service. That's kind of how it feels like sometimes. But um, yeah, I get what you're saying. So you can actually get real, you know, it, it works at a level that we haven't really seen before. Um, yeah. but, but it's text-based at the moment. So, 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 that, so if you were describing OpenAI's suite of what they're offering at the moment, is there other parts? I know they've got like image-based stuff as well. Yeah, so they've got, um, they've got a... A bunch of models basically so the models are the things that they've trained and worked on and then they release those models in different forms so it's like chat gpt is gpt 3.5 it's sort of a it's more of a marketing ui frontage of something that actually was already available that people could use but it's just the fact that 
you saw a text box, you know what to do to type into a text box. So people naturally did it and have responses and can talk sort of back and forth with this like AI system. So that's what I think really made that blow up. And then think similarly with like Dali, when that was released a couple of years ago, it was like, um, was it a couple of years ago? I, I, I get mixed This up is the image that. stuff. Yeah, the D A L L E for people who've never played yeah. around with it. Dali. Yes. Yeah. Then yeah. that's just. I think the reason that went crazy is the sort of images paint a thousand words, and it's just you can type something, and that image will be created. It's not pulled from anywhere. It's like it's this thing which is just so different to what we're used to, which is like go on, get the images or whatever it is and try and find an image for a an astronaut riding a horse on the moon. But actually, you can just type that in and that is what will come through. Um, and yeah, it just like, you can change the style, you can do a bunch of things like that. And it started off quite sort of rudimentary. You can see as you're on your screen now showing different images, there's different styles and some are like more intricate, some have more detail. Um, but these models are getting better and better. So they're like, you can have some really photorealistic portraits of people like black and white, old people really up front. I've seen some of those that are just like insane. And yeah, there's, they've got a bunch of models at OpenAI and they've got embeddings, which is like searching through data. So to see and match certain things that mean if you had a hundred thousand points of data from your customers or from whatever. And you're like, I need to know what the top, like the top comment is or what people are complaining about on our shitty chatbot type system. You could, you could basically use an embedding to map out some of those things and like get some, get some results that are actually like linked and related to the query that you're putting in. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, so we'll, we maybe we'll go into a few of those image examples. But if, you, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen it, I did a whole episode with Danny Postma last, uh, well, it was in December. So you can see the YouTube video where we he shows a bunch of the stuff that he's been building and playing around with too. The other one I want to bring up because I'm a podcast person is Whisper, which is also from OpenAI. Um, and that, from my understanding, is more about speech recognition. And yeah. so I think the example he gave on the podcast when we did it together was you could create, let's say, a tool that summarizes, you know, hour long podcast in a few, you know, bullet points or, or a few yeah. minutes or something like that. Again, some, I haven't really played with that much, but seems like a very useful tool. Um, again, none of this, like I think for a lot of people who aren't like deep in the weeds with this stuff, you'd say, okay, speech recognition has been around for a long time, right? Like we've used, uh, you know, voice search on Google, Google Translate, um, Siri, etc. But and, and there's obviously AI involved with a lot of what they're doing. But I think what we're seeing from open AI is because they're a smaller on paper, in air quotes, smaller $29 billion company, um, yeah. more nimble player, they can actually release all this stuff, right? And so that was one of the big debates happening at Google right now with DeepMind. A lot of this stuff they already have and arguably from the people I've spoken to, a lot of them think it's even better than what we're seeing on, um, you know, in chat GPT, etc. But imagine Google released, let's play around with this scenario, right? Like let's say Google released uh, chat GPT. Could you imagine like the press that how different it would be? And, and kind of rightly so, like an, an example I'd give is you'd take a screenshot of an incorrect, you know, um, answer. Let's say it was like slightly racist or it was like something that was just not very good. And that goes in the press and it's like Google, this evil big company, like they look at the what the AI is giving us. And I think I think open air has had an advantage here where you're smaller, you know, you everyone's quite kind of excited about it. And I think for a big company to release that directly, it would have been I think they would have had a bit more to attack them in, in that way. Well, but I yeah, don't know, it, what's your opinion on that? This 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 happened before. So Microsoft released this chatbot to try and be like Cool and down with the kids, I suppose. I can't remember what it's called, like Tay or something. Down with it, the kids, yeah. Yeah, and it was like within 24, 48 hours or something, it turned into like this racist chatbot that like all these kids were interacting with. And Microsoft, like, Microsoft were like, oh fuck, this is not, this was not what we planned. Not what we intended, happened. yeah. And it's the companies like that cannot have that kind of association with them. They can't have things like that happen. But 
a, in quotes, small um, startup that is saying, we are a research-based startup. We are testing stuff. Like, we are releasing these things. So you can tell us what is racist and what is, like, sexist and what is wrong. Like, that is the reason we are launching these things. They're looking for, like, feedback, feedback to actually train it do these things so yeah. that's that's the like difficult thing where google and microsoft are a bit stuck thinking we can't really release these things in case these things come back to bite us but really i think there's there's an article i, I uh, talked about it today where microsoft have got a very really big financial stake essentially in open ai they've given them, given them over a billion dollars and i think there's talk for some more or there was talk um they're now looking at ways to integrate any model of GPT into Microsoft Office, Microsoft uh, PowerPoint, and all of the rest of the sort of Microsoft suite. Um, but again, there's still like, yeah, but what if something is, is suggested during my, during me writing my meeting notes that is racist, is whatever, is like bad. There's all these things that they're, they're having to look at where jasper and all these other sort of writing tools are just like this is ai it will fuck up sometimes that's how it is like go on and do this thing and i'm sure that jasper and places like that always like they have their own training or own prompts that sort of help guide it in a certain way but yeah it is it is interesting to see it like that and i think that's why this is such a sort of code red or what everyone's saying at google is a code red because I'm sure they want to they want to show that hey actually we've got a good one yeah maybe better and we've been working on this for years we're better than OpenAI we're better than whoever and this is what you should be looking at and talking about us but also they can't do that without sort of self sabotaging their ads business for a start and then having any negative association with it if if something comes back like that um, so it is an interesting sort of battlefield of like startups versus incumbents but really is it is it that is it just like i don't know just a big testing field for all of us yeah for all the guinea pigs yeah completely well that, i think that was a great segue into some of the stuff i wanted to talk about around google microsoft and kind of like the innovators dilemma here like that is a famous thing in the tech world where essentially in this case the bigger company here let's say Google, right? Google makes 90 plus percent of its money from, I think it's 90 percent probably from search ads still, or like 90 percent plus on ads. Uh, I don't know the exact breakdown anymore, but maybe YouTube's taken up a bigger segment than I can remember. Um, and the way, you know, if you, the way chat GPT works or a Google assistant would work, if you show someone an answer straight away, Essentially, the I'm feeling lucky button of, of Google, like imagine you search on Google and you went directly to the website that it predicted would be most relevant versus going to the search landing page and then being exposed to all those ads and you choosing as a human. That is that moment where Google monetizes very, very well. Yeah. And now if 100% of searches were going through this, you know, or maybe not even 100%, let's say 50%, it, it'll, it'll be a significant impact even at 1%, to be honest. Um, and it was going to the direct page or giving you a direct answer that starts cutting into that page where you're making billions and billions of dollars and so i think that is kind of the dilemma they're in is which is how do we put this out into the world where it's useful but how do we still monetize it um, and i think that's where someone like an open ai and i think honestly microsoft from the outside are really well positioned because microsoft business is one they're getting a massive stake in open ai so they're you know playing with them already they're getting the upside of that investment but more importantly they're getting all these probably special favors right like they're going to integrate like you said into into office there's talk about how they're going to integrate into bing search and you, just a visual search already imagine example here we just talked about um you know you're looking for an image to use in your blog post or your coursework at school and previously you were using Google Images, but here you can create custom images in, let's say, Bing Image Search, if that's the future. And um, Microsoft have, they've got an image creator tool that is impl an implementation of Dali. So they have that Oh, already. really? I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's only like maybe a month old, um, which is old in AI, I suppose. But it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you're seeing that, I mean, Microsoft are providing 
plenty of like compute power for open AI to run these huge experiments and costly experiments and everything else. But in return, they get yeah, favorable things. And like you're talking about with Bing, Bing can probably afford to do something a bit riskier because not that many many people go to Bing over Google. But also Google's been enjoying this nice ride of, hey, no one else can touch us, no one cares about anything else, even though the experience for the user has been so declining a while. Like, yeah. like you, you even said it's put on you then to do the work. Like, I don't want to do the work. If I'm searching for something, you tell me what I'm like the answer. I'm not looking for me to then become the thing that I need to like, I'm, I've got tasks to do now. Like I've asked yeah. you something, I've got the task now. I've gone through these three or four links, avoiding the top four links, finding out out of these three or four, which one I actually, I'm trying to find the recipe. And it's actually not that one. It's not maybe this one, not that one. I just, I want a rest. I just want a recipe, which one's better. Yeah. I don't know. And if you had a more of a language log model, search experience it would just tell you this is a recipe for french onion soup for example so yeah if there's different incentives and different goals when searching and there is a debate on like language models as a search tool versus like what it should be as a working assistant or a partner they sort they're all different use cases but really you're almost assuming they're all the same thing where you can be like well i just want to search for this thing or actually i want to write a blog post but that same thing is there for the same purpose. So it's a bit, it's a bit yeah. strange. Uh, so I think that's a really good point. And I 100% agree. I think the the search results page has been increasingly cluttered. Um, you know, you can argue about how bad it's become because we still use it versus other alternatives. The, the one area I'd, I'd love to d- dig into a little bit deeper is that philosophical question of, should the computer tell you the answer or is it where basically where that sandwich ends right like what you mentioned earlier so like is it on the user to decide versus is the computer just going to tell me each time and so like a lot of these things i think the answer is kind of in the middle it's rarely like black and white so the way i would think about it deeper is, is certain categories of searches that might make more sense for the user to be like you know browsing and picking what they actually prefer and not give an actual definitive answer around this is right and wrong. Whereas if you say, give me a basic, you know, recipe of French onion soup, that's a pretty, that's actually a pretty easy one to say, here it is, this is how you do it, here's an image. Um, and you know, the results page on Google right now takes you like allrecipes.com or something, and you've got like 50 ads. And you know, that isn't a good experience for anyone. So yeah. that is a kind of form of the internet we're in right now. Um, and I think I agree, like in a few years from now, that won't be the case. There will be, maybe it'll be an open AI thing or Bing or Google, or someone will have a, a user interface for you to be able to do that in simple terms. Um, or maybe it'll be all recipes actually <laughs> evolves and, and gets rid of those damn banner ads. Um, but and another example I give on a counterpoint is like travel, right? So if I say, tell me the best hotel to stay in Barcelona. That is a more subjective, you know, um, search. And like my preferences as a user, they can be learnt by an AI, by, you know, um, the search engine. And arguably they already have started to do some of those things. But this is more on, let's say we go into Airbnb site or booking.com. That is then for that user to figure out like what is best for them. Um, so and and those are actually the big categories of searches where you know Google makes a lot of money, right? Like retail, you know, shopping and travel, banking, finance, stuff like that. So, but I, I saw your face there, so I want to pause for a minute and get your opinion on that before we move on. Yeah, so I think it's a good point. I think there are different, like I was saying, there's different categories of search. It's like I want an answer, or I want some work to be done to sort of collate and create the best answer based on a few things. So the travel is a really interesting one where for me, I'm quite a snobby traveler. I like traveling. Like I like to go to nice places. I, like, I don't like certain parts of the plane. I like to make sure I'm at the front or any of those. You're all right, of... mate. First class. All right. I get it. <laughs> no, 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 I mean like, I'm joking no, no, I just mean like on easy jet. I want to be in the first few rows. Oh just... yeah. No, I'm just oh, messing with you. Yeah. But you don't yeah. want to be on the, the, the row right next to the toilets is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Things like that. So I'm just like, okay, there's a few things that I'm like, 
I'll always want priority boarding so I can get it, get on and get off and all of the rest of it. So there'll be things like that, that like, if you could go into my computer now, my, my actual assistant can go and find out. And she knows that. So she knows mm, yeah. from the future. I know that he'll only stay in these kind of hotels, likes to fl- fly like this, blah, blah, blah. That's not a hard task to learn. So what do you think of AI and all the things that it can pick up? And if it was just like in your machine, how much of that it would have seen all of the places you, on your calendar would have seen all the hotels you've been to any reviews you've given any stuff like that, it would probably be able to pick up. And then when you're saying, give me a, I want to go to my, like, I want to go to Milan in February. Like it knows. Yeah. Oh, great point. Uh, son, it knows that I want to stay in certain things. It knows I don't like walking anywhere. And I don't want to get the bus anywhere. I want to like be right in the middle of everything. If it so doesn't my- know automatically. You should be able to tell it like the assistant, right? Like I, I 100% agree. This is yeah. a better version of what we have right now. It doesn't really exist in his current form right like it's just best, it's just still down to you again to say right okay i've got these yeah. 800 properties on booking.com i'm going to use the filters for these things to make sure that we look whittle it down to yeah. 100 and i'm like okay sort by price or whatever it is and then you're like you're going down opening a few okay there's a few deal breakers in this this one doesn't have park and this one doesn't have a pool or whatever but like again I'm spending time having to go through that when my search history is often I'm type I'm doing the same filters every time. And even there's plenty of sites that learn your preferences. Yeah. Right? So why wouldn't your An own AI? Yeah. AI. And this is something that I think this is like going a bit into the future, which we'll see. But I think that you'll have you'll have your own like AI yourself. Like it'll be on your machine, it'll be wherever you go. It's but I'll AI and I'll be Ben AI and I'll just talk to it because it's learned everything about my stuff. But it'll be things where I'm like, hey, I want to build, I want a Chrome extension that scrapes this thing and pulls out these things and sends it to me every day via email. Like if there's not, like there are services out there that do certain things like that, but maybe not quite what you want. There might be a developer you can hire to do that kind of thing. You might be able to automate it with a certain all that stuff but i think if you can think something like that and actually like the ai can create code it's not going to be far off until it can yeah. create and deploy it onto your machine yeah, that's you brilliant. like right i want to, i want ben's travel bot now and i want it to always remember that i like being in the first five rows wherever i'm going uh minus first class and then i want to be in this place in this place and i like hot country all of that stuff so you could even you could even have a Hey, I'm feeling lucky. Book me a trip. Like mm. check my calendar, see when I'm free. Yeah. Book stuff and just like you could. I don't. I don't think that's that far off. But that's a no. First of all, I love this idea because I mean, this is. I don't know if you've seen anyone making this, but if not, someone should be working on this specific use case because I, I think what I've when you look at like technology trends and how a big thing like this comes along. Normally, what happens is you have like this big broad trend but then the best use cases are like very specific they're like niche down a lot of the time and they're verticalized you, you kind of get both but a lot of the time you get like an ai assistant for legal work and an ai system for copywriting and marketing and an ai system for travel but that this one sounds so fun right like imagine like building something like this where you're just you're you're basically training your personal assistant to say these are the things i like whether that is travel eating out anything like hospitality in this case and now wherever i go whether i'm traveling back home to london i'm seeing my family it will already know that from my calendar if i've given it permission um and it knows the days i'm free like you said that is a really powerful thing to be able to actually deploy that and that's a better version of search right now right like it's not a search anymore it's a it's actual assistant yeah, you want you want the action because you're only doing the search because there's probably an action behind the search so there's a search so then you can go and cook like make that recipe or book that flight whatever it yeah. is. So, and if there is there is an action to have or if you if you're just looking up something that's like information how much is like lewis hamilton worth you could just type that into chat GBT type thing and hope that it's created like collating the right information, which it doesn't at the moment, but that's, that's a sort of future state of that. And there's a few yeah. other things which um, do things like that and provide some sources and stuff, but it's more like 
hey, I'm I'm searching for like outdoor furniture, like my patio is this size. I want this many seats. I kind of want a bench as well as a table and like a lounger or whatever. You want to actually buy something at the end there. And I think there's, maybe that was a bad example because you, like I'd probably want to see some things in the middle, but it doesn't mean that I want to go and see like 10 websites of 10 variations of everything. And like, we do this now because we've just, I've done the house so that everything's got a million variations and you're in between two like so I want this lamp or this lamp I was like I don't fucking care really <laughs> I only care that that one says it's 500 quid and like, this one's 150 so let's yeah. go for the cheaper one because that's like but some of those things can be programmed in you could say this is the style of house I like I like farmhouse style I don't like grey I don't want this thing or whatever it is I want some more character in the house and there are interior like interior AI and there's things like that now but there's like, why do I have to talk to an interior designer if I, yeah. I know vaguely what I like? I don't know what it's going to look like because not many people do, but I think, I don't know, there's a bunch of stuff where I think really AI can do the actions or like come to you with, you're a click away from this decision already being sorted. Yeah. And that's Completely. what I think it's supposed to be. Okay, so yeah, that was, that was, I think that was actually a pretty good example because you're essentially feeding the machine inputs and you're saying i'm training you by telling you what my preferences are and likes and now the output is you're going to give me options like you said it doesn't have to be here's the one table you're actually going to buy maybe your request is show me the three top three top five visually the ones that i think i'm going to like the most um and again i, I would say you know a lot of websites and stuff and apps already are doing stuff like this right like uh, you but in a very limited capacity right even like i don't know if pinterest is a good example but you know where people go and pin stuff all over the place or i'm sure booking.com and airbnb are using you know your preferences what you've booked in the past to be able to recommend stuff and that kind of brings up this bigger question of again without knowing the technical details of this my understanding is the part here that is really key is the access to that information. So you said earlier, access to my calendar, access to my inbox, access to my preferences that I've trained it on. And that is why I think longer term is gonna be Google, Microsoft, or insert another big company plus OpenAI, or in conjunction with OpenAI. That because the, just to be able to get access to that information is already kind of a really big part of this. And then the second part is the compute power, which you you mentioned you know earlier as well. Microsoft and Google have that already, and so do the big players. Um, yeah. So like getting access to that unique information is why I think when you saw, you know, when I was still at Google, they they talk. I remember Sundar saying. Um, the CEO, he said, we've moved from a mobile first world to an AI first world. And this is like many, many years ago, right? Like, and, and you know, they've been working on it since then, right? It's not the whole company got pivoted in that direction. And the example I always give is the Google Assistant, right? It's nowhere near as good as chat GPT, but the idea, what they pitched on stage was you're gonna be able to call the DMV office and make an appointment because it knows your calendar, um, op open stuff, it knows how far you are from it. And in, in some ways it actually worked. Like I remember going to a meeting and it had already pinged me on my phone saying there's traffic and we know you need to be in this place. It knows my current location and you need to leave 20 minutes earlier because there's traffic. And that, when that happened, I was like, wow, this is like kind of magical. I've never seen that before. Uh, but since then, not much has really happened from the outside anyway. And it's so just, I think, yeah, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it's all those magical things that like all these tech companies promise and say like, oh, this, like, this assistant yeah. in your pocket that's always gonna be able to help you with everything. It's actually being able to do that. And like, exactly. And I think, like you said, Google, has got my calendar, got my email, got everything, got all my search results. And Google, I think, are trying to do it themselves. They're trying to make you browse less because they're putting everything on the front page. So that if you're searching flights, first thing that comes up is Google Flights to one-click book. Shopping is there to one-click buy something. Like they yeah. they know that this pattern is something. And I think slap AI on, AI on it and it's a different experience. And, and so I completely agree the, the hard part is actually delivering the promise, right? Like these are all like magical ideas. And that's kind of why, like when we did this podcast with Trung and Jack on NIA, we talked about, 
chat GPT. And I was saying like, look, this is the first time in maybe 10, 15 years where I use some sort of technology where I was like, wow, this is a next level experience. Um, but again, I was like, look, there's a million or two people using this, five million, whatever it is now. I, I don't know the exact number. When you get to billions of people, there's there's a lot more stuff. Well, one, it gets more powerful, but also there's a lot more problems and, and stuff as well. And so we're just very, very early is kind of what I was saying in, in figuring out all these promises that they're also promising. They haven't all come to fruition just yet either. So the, the kind of question is who's really in a position to deliver on this? And, uh, you know, I... I I get your sense from what you're saying is like OpenAI or a smaller company is probably best suited to doing this. But I'm curious on your opinion on Google, Microsoft, even Apple, Facebook, to extrapolate into the bigger companies, Amazon as well. But how do you see this playing out over the next few years with these big companies kind of competing for this next big thing? Um, like Well, like I said, I think they're probably better. They're probably the best place to like, if they've been working on a bunch of stuff, I think it's the startups like OpenAI that help them realize that, like, okay, this is actually more critical or something we need to implement. And actually they've done it in a different way and maybe that's helping or whatever it is. But like AI is no surprise to any of these big companies. Like you said, they've all been thinking about or building something or tinkering on something. Um, and I don't, like, it's, it will take a lot for a startup to come in and like completely dethrone any of these massive companies. But like, it's not out of the question. I think this is what unfortunately feels like most of us want that to happen just to be like, see, you weren't like, you didn't, you weren't all yeah. powerful and like no one could take you down. We wanted a better experience and actually this company provided it. And that's why we're all on this one. But yeah. And that's what happened in the past, right? Like, this happens every like 15 20 years there's there's new new companies that pop up like if you go into the 80s and 90s what ran tech is very different to the 2000s microsoft had their time then it went down apple went down google facebook took over and now we're seeing like you know the problems with all these companies as well so yeah i i completely agree with that part um what about um have you seen from your vantage point like Apple is another interesting example because I was reading the Ben Thompson email from this morning and he was talking, about, I don't yeah. know if you read that yet, but um, he was talking about how Apple has been developing stuff, uh, well, how Apple are going to be playing in this space as well. And so they're trying to make it very easy for developers to use, I guess, like stable diffusion or, or something like that on the, the iPhone itself versus having to do this stuff on the server side uh, again i don't know the full technical details of this but that was just one idea that i heard that's the first time i've heard anyone talking about apple in this whole space right now so i'm curious what you think of like apple and even amazon uh amazon also has aws right so i wonder how they're going to play in this space as well with their their expertise yeah well i think they both they both got like text-to-speech stuff going on so apple did a they've got like two AI voices that sound really good actually um, for their audiobooks. I oh, think. yeah, yeah. Saw that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's something going on there. And I think Amazon almost in the past shot themselves in the foot because they banned, they banned like something to do with that, like AI generated voices. So they said they'll never do that. And then I think soon they'll just be like, oh, yeah, we do offer that, by the way. Um, every book hat comes with its own AI counterpart. Um, but I don't know. It's going to be really interesting to see what they do. It's not, and it's not just that big companies have to go quick. Let's put something out in AI. Like let's put our AI product out. There's like every other consideration of how does our, how does this organization within Amazon or Apple affect and like disrupt or hurt that other one. And then there's that other one. And then there's so many levels of approval and all of the rest of it. That I think that's the bit that, almost is going to slow down a bunch of this AI in big companies. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they, they almost start internally and they build internal AI systems and they do a bunch of stuff there. And then that's what becomes on the outside. I think the thing is it needs to be a fairly big, like if they're going to launch anything, it feels like it needs to be a very big thing. So whether that's like AWS disrupting its own AWS side of the business with AI somewhere, 
like it will need to be something quite drastic that actually then does change things. I think for Facebook to say, oh, well, our algorithm now just like has AI in it or this content that is AI like personalized for you. I, I don't know and if any of that's going to really matter or anyone's going to care. And, well, that, and that's a good, that's a good example because I guess they already do use AI and all those things, right? Like the newsfeed ads, you know, their best in class ads are all, you know, AI driven essentially, right? Um, well, there's AI models that like make them work really well. Um, so it's that that's kind of something you've probably heard me say on the other pod a lot is like when new technologies come about, all of us who are really into this stuff talk about all the fancy words and, and like buzzwords and stuff. But by the time it actually hits billions of people, you know, people watching a Facebook ad don't say that's an AI generated ad. They're just like, oh, that's an ad on Instagram, right? Yeah. Um, and and yeah. so that's kind of when it actually hits mainstream is where it's just an ad, but that you don't need to worry what's happening in the back end. And um, so it will yeah. be interesting to see how like these guys keep developing in that space as well. Um, yeah. So um, just to close that part, I, I did want to, bring up a few examples because um we you'd share this in your email i'm going to share my screen really quickly here this is askmybook.com um and you know sahil right so maybe i can let you tell people what this is yeah so sahil is the ceo of Gum, uh, gumroad and he wrote a book i think it was last or published it last year which was like how to be was it the minimum the minimalist entrepreneur so how to yeah do more with less basically. So he then created this website, which you enter a question like, how should I find a co-founder? And then you ask it. Let's see if this works. <laughs> oh, the curse of live, live demos is happening. Oh. So then it okay. will, I, I can't hear it, but it does, okay. it basically shows you an answer and then says, start by looking for people who have complementary skills, blah, 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 blah. But actually, it also has a voice, like repeating what the answer says. So yeah, that, yeah, that's built with Resemble AI, I believe. Um, so that's like you can train your own voice. You can just like you. They give you a bunch of stuff that you repeat, and then it just has an AI voice that is based off of your voice. So you can type in anything, and it can then speak like you would speak. Um, so there's a few interesting things. Obviously, that's one of them as part of this little system. But essentially, I think a lot of us are looking for this kind of system where we've got data, whatever data that is, and we want to ask a question like to that data. Maybe I don't know how to pull out that data or I don't want to look through thousands of lines of whatever that data is to find an answer. I want to know that, say, it's in my notes or something, and I've got hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes. Um where was I talking about how to be a good like founder or whatever? Then having the AI pull those answers Figure out. Figure that out for you, yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually did, this is something that we mentioned earlier, which is I set this system up, or a similar one, a very basic version of this with OpenAI and Zapier and Google Sheets. So- I'm just pulling it up on my screen while you're, while you're speaking yeah, so there. I really wanted to like, because like I said, this is a, an exact scenario that I just I see over and over again, which is like, I want to ask my Google sheet a question and just have this it is, come out. By the way, what I'm sharing is this is the right one, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, so I, I've thrown a few like of the new Zapier t um, tools in there. So there's interfaces, which is like in this instance, there's a form. So you type in, I've basically got data on animals, which is what is the tallest animal? What's the longest fish? things like that, just to like test if this worked. So basically put it into a Google Sheet, and then there's a, a text box. What is the tallest? You type in what's the tallest animal in the world, and then there's a table that will just say the giraffe is the tallest animal. And it basically it's all done without code. Like essentially you, you, pull out, you pull out all of the data that you've got, and then with search embedding, so embedding model, which I talked about earlier, it'll use that question and search your data using the embedded model. So it'll sort of match up, okay, actually, there is tallest fish in this answer, there is tallest whatever in this answer, but actually the tallest animal, like the highest ranked question answer combination there is the giraffe is the tallest animal. So then it'll pull that out as the most highly scored match 
in that system. So it's a very like complicated way of saying you're going to ask a question of your data and not come out with the most relevant answer. That's very cool. So just to clarify, that is actually pulling from similar to Sahil's um, tool there. That's actually pulling from your own data set. It's a it's yeah. not like just crawling the web or whatever. No, it's, no, no, no. You're giving it knowledge essentially, and you're letting it pull the answer, and it works pretty accurately. And so, yeah. and then the cool thing with sorry, I don't know where my other screen's gone, but um, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'll pull that up in a second. But yeah. Um, so the reason I was really interested in this is just because that to me is like a really interesting use case around, you know, I have a podcast. I'm obviously very passionate yeah. about sharing knowledge and learning myself. So I was just thinking as a student, imagine you, like you said there, like you're taking all these notes all year or you've got, you know, notes from your lectures or whatever. And you, you basically create this, you know, as our boy Tiago will say, second brain or whatever, right. if you've got it in a digital form anyway. Um, and and now instead of just having it there and searching on Evernote or whatever, you're actually just creating a personalized search engine essentially. Yeah. And that is a really powerful thing. And and I think what was cool with Sahil's thing was, um, you, you know, he you, I don't know if people could hear that on the audio side, but it was reading out in his voice which is also, I think it was his voice, right? It sounds yeah, sound it, like it. It's, it's his voice that's tra is trained on resemble. Yeah, and, and it yeah. was really, like, really good. It, it sounds like him. It's not like, it doesn't sound like a computer generated thing. It's, it's really yeah. cool. So, so that is really interesting. If you just think of, I know there was um, Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs, podcast.ai example, yeah. which was quite an interesting example. But even like someone like me, nowhere near as, you know, uh, as much content as Joe Rogan, but I've got hundreds of hours of stuff where I've interviewed people. Um, and just being able to put that into one place and be able to like essentially search it would be really cool. And to be able to like summarize that knowledge, even for myself, just as a cool tool. So yeah, yeah maybe I might have to play around with what you're doing there to see how yeah. I could potentially do it. Yeah, you could just get like the transcripts of all your transcription, well, use AI to transcribe all of the episodes you've done. And then you could ask questions to it, like, what do the best makers, like, what's the what's the daily habits of the best founders, like, from this podcast? And then anywhere there's this sort of habits that come up saying, oh, I'm, like, I work late or whatever, whatever those things are, it should be able to pull out some of that stuff. Obviously, there's a bunch of, like, more intricate details. This is very, like, simple, ask a question, get an answer type of thing, but there's... There's actual prompting you can do. There's like examples you can actually inject in there and all of the rest of it. So there's a lot more that can be done. It's just, that's the most basic version. Yeah, really cool. Yeah, and so I guess a lot of this comes back to what you said. It's like really in the making it actually good. Like it sounds like a cool wizard hat idea as Tim Urban yeah. would say, but actually making something give the answer that you're looking for that resembles some sort of sense is really hard. And I'll say even with chat GPT, right? Like we've, we've talked about how good it is. There are times where I ask it something and it, it's not returning what, it doesn't make any sense what you're saying essentially. Um, but I'm sure that's going to get a lot better over time. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just, oh, sorry. Were you going to say something there? Yeah, there's plenty of times where it's wrong and it sounds really right. It sounds like it's coming back. Oh, with yeah. Data and it's just complete nonsense. But I think part of it is like the system of how it works. It's almost like it's guessing the next word as a pattern, but I mean, that sounds really bad when you say it like that, but also if you start speaking a sentence, like the sentence I'm speaking right now, I don't know the next word that's coming out of it, but my neural nets in my brain, luckily can form that sentence into a long winded way of saying, that's just sort of how some of these things work. But yeah, it is, there's some, there's lots of like conversation. I mean, we can go on for an hour talking about all of that, like the wrong information that comes out with and all the rest of it. But yeah, that's, uh, that's for another time. Yeah, well, and just for balance here, I do want to bring up this. There was a thread by Francois Cholet. I don't know if I'm saying his surname correctly. Uh, I'm just reading out the first tweet he wrote. Um, it's kind of a counterpoint to all the kind of hype around AI right now. And he said, the current climate in AI has so many parallels to 2021 Web3. It's making me uncomfortable. Narratives based on zero data are accepted as self-evident. 
everyone is expecting uh, uh, everyone is expected as a sure thing civilization altering impact and 100 x returns on investment in the next two to three years and so he's he's written a whole thread but the kind of gist of this was you know the the kind of joke that we always make is you know a year ago everyone who was into web3 is now into ai and and i'm i think it's a little bit of a cynical take because most of the time those people were also interested in the latest technology trends that were actually real things like i've been into that stuff since i was a kid as i'm sure you have as well and sometimes it ends up being a real thing and sometimes it, it doesn't and you know so it, it doesn't mean just because someone's now interested in ai it's because that's just a new hot thing um, and therefore everything they were interested in web3 is no longer valid it's just both can be true and things can get a little hyped up and uh you could, everyone could get a bit excited especially when they're making money off monkey jpegs you know so i understand why that happens but i, yeah. I feel like on twitter especially I, I see this like cynical take from a lot of people which is just like basically dismissing anyone who's now interested in like researching it or talking about it which uh, is the opposite of why i want like my twitter timeline to be uh, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, same. yeah same i mean yeah he's he's a smart guy and but he like there's some merit in what you're saying and i think it's no different from anything you see on twitter if you look on twitter you'll see hey how i used ai to make eight figures in revenue here's the thread here's how you can do it to like like i don't know the, all these chat the all these ai tools yeah. should be legal all of that stuff is like the yeah, same stuff all, yeah all yeah shit. no one gives a shit about that but some people still like it and retweet it anyway that's fine but i think for that to be the reason why everything's overhyped i would just ignore that because that's people like looking for engagement anyway but it's more that yeah we are in the tech world we're on twitter talking about tech stuff anything yeah. in, in tech is most likely what we're all going to go towards and yeah web3 is like a massive burning pile of whatever at the moment <laughs> so yeah. why why well it's not a bad thing for us to be looking at ai to be like oh this is actually really interesting I think there's some, there's probably some good conversations to have around. Well, actually, for us to actually like verify an image is real, what's good technology out there? Yeah. That like, how yeah, can it actually work that. off that as well? Yeah, completely. Yeah. There's, there's lots of things that you could, you could always like connect the dots and everything else. But I think like there's always going to be hype when something goes as big or as viral, or there are these promises to like, Hey, in the future we'll have robots like doing our yeah. laundry stuff, which we've always said that. That's always been the thing that everyone's like saying, Oh yeah, there'll be a robot, like iRobot and things like that. You're thinking there'll be one helping you. There's always that. It's just now because there is actual AI stuff happening, you're almost thinking, Oh, now you're thinking too like you're thinking too much into like having a robot in your house. Yeah. Like, yeah, but everyone's been thinking that, about that for decades so yeah and what well, and, and uh, great just to build off what you said there i think similar to what i said earlier about when it actually becomes human behavior you don't call it that buzzword anymore or even like robot in this case because i would argue like we've all got this you know we've got a super machine in our pocket that gives us the answer to basically any question we have in the world without all the great stuff of chat gpt or whatever but even just google search or you know whatever we've got the world's biggest entertainment library in our pocket like all these amazing things that we've just got completely used to right and um it, it's just like sometimes you have to take a step back and say man it's crazy i can pull out my phone and talk to my parents three thousand miles away in like hd definition like like i'm there in the room with them almost and we've just got so kind of spoiled by all of this stuff that we don't realize how like magical it is at, at times. Um, yeah. And I feel like the same with this, like in 10 years time, if we're just training the AI to book our flight for us because it knows all our preferences, we'll just say, oh yeah, but that's just like that app, like the name of the app or whatever, because that is how it works. Um, yeah. You know, so it's just, I think like the kind of innovators curve, that is what happens. Like the early adopters and innovators are the ones fielding all this new stuff. They've they play with the stuff when it's broken and it gets to a stage where now everyone uses uber and everyone uses airbnb but at one point it was just those early adopters so um yeah just to wrap up because i know we're going a few minutes over so i just want to make sure you got time to get to do all the stuff you were going to do after um let's look forward to the year because i know both of us are not a fan of actually 
predicting stuff, but you did the the smart way and asked a bunch of smart people their predictions for uh, 2023. Twitter, unless we'll put on smart. People. Oh yeah, yeah, smart people. That's that's true. You had to filter through. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So um, yeah. Well, I mean, just from that exercise, were there? Let's just say for the next year or, or whatever time frame you really want to pick, actually, let's say a year to five years, whatever you think makes more sense with this stuff. What are some of the things you think we're going to be seeing in the next few years in this space? I think, well, we'll have chat GB, we'll have GPT-4 coming out in the next few months, I think. And then there's like all the Bing stuff with OpenAI, like all of these big hot topics of like, ooh, what's actually going to happen in these big like the Google versus Microsoft war, I think we'll all be around to witness that, which I think will be interesting anyway. Um, I just think there'll be a really big push on, okay, what is factually correct? What is harmful? What is like, what is the actual AI safety problem? How do we actually make sure that we're on top of that and things aren't getting out of control? Because it's very difficult to teach AI what harm is in terms of like what harm is for me, for you, for us to chat if we're friends and we're saying certain things, we ch- everything changes in context. So yeah, that's a great point. point. Um, to actually like teach, but I think like it's probably all the boring things that we're well, not boring, but it's like the things that you don't want to really think about too much is where I think AI will make the most impact, like curing Alzheimer's or any of these kinds of things where where we need to run data and tests and run a bunch of different scenarios, AI can do it in a time that humans cannot. There's just a bunch of stuff there. I think that will, that will really blow it all up. And I just, I kind of hope we see a lot of the like copycat AI little tools. I'm fine for like lots of indie makers to make all these small individual tools, like another writing tool for we're using AI, but essentially if they're all built on the same model, Every time the model gets better, the tools get better, but also there's like a smaller gap of why I'm picking that tool versus just using chat GPT. So like, I think there's a lot there that people are building on sort of rocky soil. And I think that it might crumble if, well, just when the other models get better or they release something like when GPT-4 comes out, it might be that, okay, now all of these startups are now redundant because they try to build certain things that was basically a wrapper on top of yeah AI. and i just want like i don't want people to get burnt by assuming that their thing their like ai slides um tool is going to be the next big thing when really when microsoft just adopted in powerpoint and google just adopted in slides that's probably 80 90 of the market share you're like okay poof out the window so i, I really don't want people following the wrong path i think looking at what research is out there as much as it's difficult to read it. I think trying to look at like, okay, well, what, what does this look like? What does a business idea look like given this research? Like, does this work out? And then if so, how does, how do we see stuff in the future? Like, I think there'll be loads of interesting things there, but who knows? I don't know predictions or any good ones at least. So love it. All right. That's good. Yeah. I'm reading some of the responses to your, your thread there uh but there, there was this one guy nt chris with a k and i don't know how to say his name but uh G, kind of similar what you said gpt4 wows everyone lots of false positive reaches a steady state this one i thought was interesting regulation is front and center for non-text generative ai audio video pictures i think that is a really interesting point i didn't really think too much about i think you might have kind of touched on it earlier but that is if, if we're just talking about if that example I said of Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs, that was a fun AI generated thing. Everyone knew what it was, but we're already in a in a place where it's really hard to know what's real and what isn't. Like deep fakes, I mean, actually beyond deep fakes, just like tweets, <laughs> right? Like the yeah. way we don't know who's like verified nowadays. Like it looks like George Bush has said something crazy. Like yeah. the day that everyone could pay for a, a verified um, check mark. And if you just take that, extrapolate that into much more powerful, you know, personalized search engines and really good voice and video. I mean, it's going to be almost impossible just to know what's real, right? Like I'm, I'm maybe... Yeah. I don't know if there's ways that they can um, 
forgot what the word is here. I know like chat GPT has a way of basically seeing that it came from chat GPT. Um, it's like watermarking it. Watermarking, like, that's the phrase I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, so there's there's some, I think there's people making tools that are sort of there to help show that, okay, actually this is, gen, there's one called GPT-0, which is like, yeah, this is generated by AI. So there's a bunch of things there, which, and I, I saw a tweet somewhere again, I can't verify if it's true or not, but someone did that and then they said they changed one word in that piece of text, run it again, and it was like, it changed completely and it didn't know it was AI generated. So there's, there's things oh, that's there. interesting. I mean, that's going to be a really interesting, like I'm glad I'm not going to do anything in it at all because that sounds a really hard problem to do. Yeah, which, yeah, like, completely. Verifying all of that stuff. And, I, and that's why I think the brand of like Ben's Bites and people knowing that it's like, it's actually me and thinking that like in the world of AI generated content and anyone can spit out any amount of content knowing that it's like I'm there and people are tagging me in tweets and I'm then they're going in the newsletter and there's like, it's me doing stuff. And I think the yeah, yeah. personal brands, they'll win way more in this age of AI than companies or corporates will because people just yeah. are like, yeah, I, I, people are already sort of fed up with that anyway and people always do that. But it's... And they trust the person more, even like a media organization like now we've moved to a place where we trust certain journalists and not others or certain writers we like and others we don't so i completely agree with that take and and as it's kind of like why right in the beginning of this chat i called you a curator right like i, I feel the same way um you know and you're not just a curator you do lots of other things but you know with ben's bites that's how i see you you're curating the most you're filtering out the stuff that i should be reading in five minutes not the 10 hours i could be spending every day on it and yeah. that's how like how i treat nia in a way not investment advice even the podcast create lab that create lab's a little bit different it's a bit more like deeper conversations let you guys share what you want to share but not investment advice is similar whereas you're not going to spend all week reading all the stuff me, Trung, and Jack read, and we're just going to spitball around and mess around and talk about fun stuff. And that's why a lot of people like it. But yeah. similar on the on on the email side, like knowing that it's not just an algorithm pulling the best stuff is actually what makes it valuable, which is kind of an interesting, funny thing yeah. in itself, right? Given yeah. everything we've talked about. Um, yeah. I do want to ask you a question really quickly on... The newsletter but this is getting in the weeds but i'm curious doing a daily one is insane first of all like i know how hard it is just to write you know anything every day uh, is really difficult um what's your actual process for that right now like because you i know you're mr no code and i'm sure you've got certain tools to help you speed things up and maybe organize things i'm curious how you're doing it right now yeah i mean and i hate writing and i never wanted to do any of this stuff so it, it's just like I sort of gave myself a little challenge. The first two days, I wrote it like long form text. And it, I just found it too hard for myself to do that. And I was like, I can't, I can't do this a third day and a fourth day and a fifth day. So in that case, I can't do it. And I won't want to do it. So then in that case, let's, let's cross that out. So it became more of that curated, I can add a comment here and there. And now on Ben's picks, I, I go into a bit more depth. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just... I spent a lot of time on Twitter and luckily from doing the newsletter, now people just tag me and ev like everywhere get messages all the time, which has this pros and cons and <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. Off and stuff. I'll save it using an automation that goes into like a notes in my notes, literally just appends the link. Wait, then, just, yeah. just to go in the weeds with that. When you say save with automation, what does that actually look like? Like so if, if I tag you in a tweet, what do you do from there? I will see the tweet and then I'll decide I'll actually I'll copy the link to the tweet that I think should go in the email. Then I will go and with a shortcut, I open Apple short Apple shortcuts or whatever it's called now, smart cuts. So that then does a web hook call to a Zapier zap. Hopefully I've lost everyone now so they won't copy I it. I love it. No, no, I'm so glad <laughs> I asked this question because even if no one listens, like it's, I love this stuff. Yeah, it's so, really yeah, helpful to know. Basically, I, pull, I, I get the contents of the URL, it goes through, goes through the webhook and then from there, it just like brings out the title and description or something and puts it in. But then every day I'll go through each link again, write the actual, like what is it about, highlight 
try and highlight what actually it's about and then put the link in there. So there's like manual, there's like rediscovery of things. So like I'll save way more than I actually end up putting in. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be like, oh, actually these three tweets are related. So I'll try and like tie them together or something. Um, and some things are just like, hey, I've just, I've done this. DM me or like this tweet to get in. I'm like, oh. Oh, oh yeah, you can't be no, doing no. that. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I try and- All right, like, cool. Oh, yeah. That's good to know. Yeah, no, I because I saw you had Readwise open, and yeah, I've got the whole thing set up. The, the The reason I say it is because I used to. Well, my stance on it, if people have heard this before, probably if you've listened to like Tiago, I had on to do the second brain stuff. I do think it's actually very useful for people, but I also think there's a lot of people who just overemphasize and like worry too much about tools, essentially. And like the most important thing is you're interested in doing this stuff and there's a real human who wants to read and write something every day, right? That's the most, that's 90% of it. But there are things that really speed up your work, like just literally shortcuts and, and tools like Readwise is actually a really good one for me uh, because I listen to like five, six hours of podcasts a day basically. And yeah. then, and I have this app called Snipped where I can save segments and it puts a transcript into Evernote essentially through Readwise. So that is like something that's changed like my ability to like really use that stuff again and save stuff that I'm not gonna go through a two hour podcast again, but I can go back to my highlights essentially. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's always worth asking because uh, yeah, it would be it's yeah, always, I'm always useful to some people. Anything that's gonna like save me 10 minutes, like, oh, actually I end up spending, I spend no, like time thinking about subject lines and I hate that and I haven't figured out a solution for that because I know that they do kind of matter, but I also, I can't be bothered with it mattering to me. So I'm like, there's things like that. Like I'm really trying to figure out how to like automate or do something with and use AI for, but it's just never quite right. I think so. I think there'll always I, be human element. I, I did like your one from a few days ago. You used the word in it in the uh, preview text. So <laughs> I, I was going to text you about that, but I thought I'd wait for this one just to show my appreciation. Yeah, that's I do the, love uh, a good animation one. It was like the subject so, line was 39, 20, yeah, 29 billion valuation. And then the, preview text was like it's a bit much in it <laughs> yeah exactly all right mate the perfect way to wrap us up here um so again everyone should go is it bensbytes.com is it dot co dot co coms in my life so oh fair enough bensbytes.co we'll link to it in the show notes as well everyone should definitely check it out if you don't like it after a few days you can unsubscribe but i would definitely <laughs> recommend have honestly even if you just filter it out and you want to go in once in a week and read like the daily stuff and and do that because a lot of people don't like seeing stuff every day i yeah. i don't have many things in my main inbox that are newsletters and your one comes into my main inbox so that is uh hopefully the best praise for someone who writes a newsletter uh, and yeah, thanks again definitely. for coming on mate um where can people find you on twitter and stuff is there anywhere else to send them yeah. Ben Tossle, T O W S U L. So yeah, just there. All right, we'll we'll throw that in the show notes too. And yeah, thanks again for spending time. We'll definitely get you on NIA to hang with the boys too. We'll yeah. do a version of this at some point. Uh, but appreciate you coming on, and really cool to hear all the success since we did the first episode. You got I don't know if I'm allowed to say the name of the car, but yeah, the car cool. at, uh, <laughs> the Aston Martin that you wanted, which is always a nice like for someone like me who you know makes friends through this. It's always nice to hear like the good stories of like you yeah. wanted that since you were a kid. Yeah. And you and your dad had a, a special, uh, I think, moment around that. So yeah, really yeah. happy to hear it, man. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to do this in person at some time. Yeah, yeah, really appreciate it. Cheers, Cheers mate. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.